The racing video game genre has evolved a bit since its inception. It started life in 1973 with Atari's second game, Space Race, which involved two players racing a rocket ship to the top of the screen. If you successfully dodged between asteroids and made it through, then your score increased, but encounter an asteroid, and it was back to the start for you. Jump forward to the 90s, and the genre dominated the best-selling charts on home consoles, including 10.8 million copies of Gran Turismo sold and 9.8 million copies of Mario Kart 64 sold. Skip ahead to 2022 and the genre has been pushing the limits when it comes to graphical fidelity. Whether that's accurate and detailed Hot Wheels models with fingerprints on them, or every single needle being rendered on a small cactus within a gigantic Mexican landscape. The attention to detail has never been greater, and there's no doubt it'll evolve even further in the future. As the genre has certainly grown graphically over the decades, the mechanics, however, have been pretty much exactly the same since the start. Breaking down the gameplay to its bare bones is simple. You begin at point A with the aim to reach point B first, and it's been that way ever since. Getting there is where every game is different. Unlike the usual vehicle selection of cars, motorcycles, or spacecraft, almost anything can be used to race, such as motorboats, snowmobiles, pod racers, even characters on foot. The list goes on. Whether it's a race to the finish line, a stuntman involved with the film shoot, or smashing as many cars as you can, the genre has been incredibly diverse with its content. There is one more thing surrounding racing games that largely affected arcade machines back in the 80s, the difficulty. These games were specifically designed to heavily persuade you to feed the machine with your saved up quarters, otherwise all hard-earned progress would be lost. This effect was felt through the transition to home consoles, with the NES making a name for their titles as being Nintendo Hard and made any completion attempt require gigantic amounts of dedication. It only takes a tiny whisper of Turbo Tunnel to bring up horrific memories to gamers over the age of 30. But racing games, boy, they're all Nintendo hard. Most of your old favorite racing games were diabolically difficult, especially when the control schemes available only had the inaccuracy of a D-pad to rely on. For example, let's look at one of my favorites on the original PlayStation, Destruction Derby 2. This title sees you race around in stock cars within fictional tracks set in North America, participating in stock league racing, wrecking racing, or destruction derby modes. Now, while the cars are fast with their speed exceeding 300km an hour, the handling is another story entirely, especially when using a D-pad. Try zooming down the hill at Short Canyon without touching the walls. It's impossible. Want to reach the checkered flag first? That was a dream at the time. It was never achieved outside of Pine Hills Raceway. Remember how stupidly difficult the garage level of driver was? You may be able to complete it just in time to this day, but back then, well, good luck beating that stopwatch, as it felt like you never had a chance. Sim racing and Simcade releases were no different either, as introducing a newcomer to the racing genre proved to be a huge challenge. You could do it properly by using the brakes and applying power according to track positioning, or you could go off track, slam into the walls at 100 miles an hour, and let the course naturally steer your car to the finish. As new console generations arrived, the thumbstick became a mainstay, and was a great unintended solution for the genre. This gave the player greater control over their steering angle when it comes to traversing corners, and was way more comfortable to use over a D-pad. Racing games became a lot easier to control, but their difficulty to newcomers was still prevalent. Grinding away in Gran Turismo 3A spec for a Suzuki Escudo didn't sound like the ideal night in after a stressful shift at work for the casual audience, so the only option for many racing games was an arcade-style approach. Don't get me wrong, these more serious titles were absolutely brilliant to play, but sim racing games did seem like the unpopular choice when you were given the option. Ask a teenager in 2004 whether they'd like to play Gran Turismo 4, Need for Speed Underground 2, or Burnout 3 Takedown, and there's a good chance they'll choose the latter too. The solution to introducing the casual audience to racing titles that didn't require heaps of time to progress through potentially arrived at the video game scene in 2003 with Prince of Persia Sands of Time. Now, it may seem weird at this point to bring up this game, but Ubisoft's title might have contributed to a turning point for the racing game genre. In Sands of Time, the protagonist retrieves a weapon named the Dagger of Time, which allows the player to rewind, slow down, or freeze time mechanics. Its usage can be incredibly useful within its platforming and combat scenarios, so if you made a mistake and are about to fall to your death, use a rewind power and try again. Want to slow down traps or stop enemies for easier navigation or just simply to catch your breath? The dagger allows you to, leaving plenty of room for the player to be creative. The rewind mechanic in particular was of great interest to the industry, as time manipulation wasn't all that prominent at the time, excluding the 2002 game Blinks the Time Sweep that is, which contained a different type of time bending system. 
Rewinding led to destroyed Siri coming back to life, but the player was free to move around while this mechanic was in action, lending itself as more of a puzzle process rather than a gameplay assist. Anyway, the less said about this attempted Xbox console mascot, the better. After the success of Sands of Time, rewinding time had been a staple of gameplay mechanics within titles such as Time Shift, Braid, and many others. Its usage allowed the player to make mistakes and provides a quicker way of learning gameplay elements without having to waste time waiting for death animations or loading screens. So naturally, this mechanic was begging to be used in racing games, and it was first used in everyone's favourite, Alfa Romeo Racing Italiano, developed by Milestone. Yes, the same company that also created Hot Wheels Unleashed. Look at how far they've come. As dull as this game is, there were a few interesting mechanics involved that brought a new life to the genre. RPG elements were introduced, meaning you could gain skill points to upgrade your character or car through abilities such as heart, vision, or intimidation, each with their own specific advantages within a race. The latter system meant that your character would be intimidated by racing against a driver on their tail, which would eventually lead to a blurry screen and loss of control. It was weird, but at least it was different. Just like Alfa Romeo itself, the passion and soul were clear in this title, even if it was a little wonky overall. Milestone's time rewind mechanic was the first in racing games and was weirdly named the Tiger Effect. I don't know how the two are related, but there we go. Tiger Effect is simple. Make a mistake through a collision or going off track and you could activate the ability. This would rewind time and return to the same state a few seconds ago, whilst also draining the ability that needed to recharge throughout the race. This could be upgraded through the anticipation skill, which would decrease the recharge time taken for the next available rewind. This was a great mechanic to be integrated within the racing game genre, as making mistakes would be less punishing for the player overall, thus allowing an easier time for all audiences. Codemasters later picked up this mechanic in 2008 with its title Race Driver Grid, but whether the milestone title was an influence over this ability is up for debate. Grid is phenomenal and holds up very well to this day, which is why I recommend watching John's playthrough here on the Traction channel. Anyway, the Tiger Effect mechanic was renamed more appropriately to Flashback and led the way for its inclusion within future Codemasters titles. This system is first introduced to the player after their car becomes heavily damaged, giving them the option to retire, restart, or rewind time at any point within the previous 10 seconds. Flashback could be used freely within any point of a race, but it is limited by the number of flashbacks available, depending on the selected difficulty level. The game also rewarded players if they didn't use any flashbacks within a race, and as the difficulty level increased, the number of flashbacks decreased alongside the available assists and faster AI. Since the success of the first grid, similar systems have been used in several Codemasters games including F1 and Dirt, and could be classed as a factor that introduced the genre to a more casual audience. Outside of Codemasters titles, it's been adopted by Microsoft for its Forza franchise since Motorsport 3 and feels even more at home within the Horizon spin-off series. The Horizon games contain many collectibles and objectives to complete, accessibility options and of course the rewind mechanic which makes it one of the most engrossing and accessible rating titles there is so every player can participate in events in any way they'd like to. Looking back at the title of this video, did this one button actually save the racing genre? You could argue for and against this, but I feel it did save the genre from descending into something with only a high barrier for entry. The rewind button definitely opened up the genre to a wider audience and diversified the genre itself. Forza Horizon 5 has broken the 10 million player barrier within its first week of release, but even if that number hasn't been directly affected due to its rewind ability, it's still a crucial mechanic that even the most experienced players used, and its origin is something you could argue actually planted the seeds for this genre of racing title. Before we wrap up, there's one final thing I'd like to bring up about this mechanic. As the racing genre is hard to get into and understand, there is a large debate about its usage according to difficulty, where others claim it makes the game too easy or doesn't give a good enough challenge when enabled. Now, it is understandable that rewinding time does give a training wheel to the player in the same manner as the racing line, but does it really matter? If a new player accidentally breaks a wing or bodywork on the first lap in every race they do, how exactly are they going to have a good time if they're constantly restarting or driving with said hindrance? If you're having a bad time in the game due to the high difficulty level, there is absolutely no shame in dropping it down to make it comfortable for you. If you feel rewinding makes a game too easy, don't use it. Simple. If you're one of those people who put down others for using these assists, you need to ask yourself, why? This mechanic's purpose is to reduce the difficulty by helping others learn in a quicker and much more enjoyable manner. Video games are meant to be fun, and they should be played exactly how anyone would like to. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. 
So that was our look back at the one button that saved the racing game genre. What was the first game that you played that used the rewind mechanic? Let me know in the comment section below. If you haven't already, then please do subscribe to the Traction channel and hit the like button if you want to see more editorial pieces like this in the future. Thank you very much for watching, keep it pinned, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.